companies don't get to be household names without taking a few risks along the way. As an entrepreneur, if you don't make a mistake, you don't make anything. Even the most successful designers, marketeers and executives sometimes slip up. And when they do, it can be on a monumental scale. It was a massive error of epic proportions. Epic proportions. In this series, the people who call the shots inside some of the world's best-known companies reveal how plans that seemed like a good idea at the time turned into commercial catastrophes. Everything has a beginning, middle and end, including companies. Tonight, their inside accounts of products which cost their manufacturers millions. If you're launching any revolutionary idea, you're taking a huge risk. You simply don't know how people are going to react. The decision to reinvent the world's favourite soft drink. This was either unbelievably brave or unbelievably stupid. And the mobile that wasn't mobile. It was a technology that didn't work and was spectacularly inappropriate. And British business superstars explain how to survive a corporate calamity and bounce back stronger than ever. We all make mistakes. Some are just a bit bigger than others. Tonight's cautionary tales start with risky decisions in product design and manufacturing. They end with corporate collapse and customers in revolt. First, the washing powder that destroyed stains and clothes. In a highly competitive market, a substandard product just won't wash with consumers. By the time your new product hits the shops, it has to be whiter than white. And that's where research and development comes in. But there's no point in having a product that just appears to work quite well in the laboratory. It's got to work flawlessly in the real world, which is why testing is so important. When the makers of Purcell were under pressure to develop a new product, they underestimated the importance of a defect, which made their new soap powder so powerful it shredded customers' smalls. The error meant hundreds of millions of pounds went to waste, and it left the reputation of Britain's best-selling detergent in tatters. Anything you can do, I can do better. I could do anything better than you. When you buy a washing powder, you're enlisting in the war between two giant multinationals. Brands like Daz, Bold, Fairy and Ariel are owned by Procter & Gamble. Arch-rival Unilever owns Surf, comfort and the market leader, Purcell. What a brand does is it takes the thought about decision-making out of our heads. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. It's Purcell. It's all right. It's a brand I use. It's brilliant. It's safe. It's fantastic. I don't even think these thoughts. I see it on the supermarket. I buy it. That's how it works. Launched in 1909, Purcell quickly became Britain's favourite washing powder, with an unrivalled reputation. No wonder so many of us mums choose new Purcell. It's one of the best loved brands, it's very iconic. It's associated with things like being a good mother, happy families. It has always stood for a balance of good cleaning and care. Now see these chocolate marks. In contrast, Purcell's main competitor, Ariel, was marketed to focus on the hard science of cleaning. Ariel was quite prepared to say, let's not fuss about these emotional issues. They don't matter. It was all about um, washing your clothes and getting rid of stains, and, and that's it. With Ariel Automatic, you can wash clothes up clean even when you don't boil wash. Over the years, Ariel's scientific approach appealed to more and more shoppers. By the 1990s, Purcell's dominance was on the wane and the stage was set for an almighty face-off between two super brands. They called it the Soap Wars. 
There was a lot of animosity. Ariel and Purcell were really banging heads together. A lot of frustration, a lot of intensity. The Purcell team decided it was time to make a direct attack on Ariel's tough on stains territory. They started to develop a new supercharged product line to be called Purcell Power. The idea that you would have a, a much more high powered detergent. was something that, that, that sounds extremely logical. Rumours of a miraculous stain-busting ingredient in Purcell's new product quickly reached the owners of Ariel, Procter & Gamble. They believed the cleaning agent would be too powerful for general use, and they told Purcell's team so in no uncertain terms. P&G had made it very clear to our business at the highest possible level. We don't like what you're doing. We think it is risky. If you do it, we will throw the book at you. It was a highly unusual move. Top people from one company contacting a rival to talk about a competing product. It could have sent Unilever into a spin, but the company held its nerve. All washing powders do two things. Number one, they clean clothes. Number two, they all, I repeat, all damage clothes because the washing process necessarily damages the clothing as you do the wash, it's inevitable. Purcell Power bosses were confident their own tests showed they'd got the right balance between tough cleaning and damage to clothes. And in April 94, Purcell Power hit the shops. The launch was probably the biggest we had ever done. All over the country, people are discovering a new power. It's called new Purcell Power. And it has the power of the unique patented accelerator. Unilever sent sample packs of the new powder to more than 10 million households in the country. They even came up with a catchy name for the stain-removing ingredient, a manganese catalyst. They had this term called the accelerator, which, which sounded a bit like um, the time travel capsule that, that Doctor Who uses, and scientists in white coats, which, which Purcell hadn't really done before. The accelerator makes Purcell power work faster and harder on difficult stains like red wine. It was powerful, it was aggressive, and yes, it was very effective. Customers were instantly impressed with the detergent's high-octane cleaning. It looked like Purcell Power had hung the competition out to dry. New Purcell Power gives everyone the power to get more tough stains out. First time, first wash. But the aerial team decided it was time to wash their rivals' dirty laundry in public. So they sent photos of clothes washed with Purcell Power to national newspapers across Europe. Pictures arrived on the picture desk of striped boxer shorts with holes in them. Hole in my sweater and a run in my sock. Along with a press release saying this is what happens when you use Purcell Power. And there was a lovely phrase in it. They used the phrase, if you use this product, your clothes will become shredded to the point of indecency. I mean, I don't think that the picture desk could believe their luck. When you come out boldly and say that and put a bit of proof behind it, which they've done, you could describe it as an Exocet missile. Oh, good Lord. Surely that's not true. Surely, surely that can't be right. Well, they've produced this product which is actually harming the clothes that it's supposed to be washing. Before long, consumers were checking their garments for signs of damage, and soon people were sending their tattered clothes to Unilever. The volume that we had to deal with was just staggering. They were just getting inundated with sort of piles of clothes and, and people who sort of, you know, bought something six months ago and thought, oh, you know, this is a good chance to get, to get a refund. And we had a warehouse full of garments which customers had sent back. They might have a pretty old pair of underpants that were practically on their last legs anyway, and they would say, ah, oh, chance for me to get a nice new pair of underpants here. To make matters worse, 
the Consumers Association magazine Witch stepped in to announce they were going to carry out their own independent tests. It raised the stakes considerably. And there was an immense excitement both within the organisation and indeed from the media. The washing powder Persil Power does damage some clothes, according to the Consumers Association. While perhaps not shredded to the point of indecency, the test garments did leave Persil Power dangerously exposed. We hang up on washing lines the clothes that we had uh, washed with their holes showing nicely. They had people on a catwalk. The impact clearly was uh, dramatic. Andrew Seth did his best to bat away the bad publicity. I don't think consumers think we've made a mistake, except when they've been interfered with and told to look in places that really, frankly, they're not often going to look. Here's a towel that has been washed in Purcell for two years, twice a week. You can see there's not much wrong with this. In laboratories, it is possible to say that you can find a situation where you might describe the product as defective. It's stuff and nonsense. It's a laboratory situation. It's not what consumers believe. Our tests reflect the actual way in which ordinary consumers use the product, and that's how we tested this product. Suddenly, you begin to question your own judgment, and indeed the judgment of the key people I had around me, and it was a very, very black time for all of us. They had reduced the amount of accelerator in personal power, but nine months after launch, shops were losing faith. Tesco started removing personal power from the shelves and shortly after that Sainsbury's started doing the same. The retreat, if you want to call it the retreat, was very, very costly. Maybe it's a bit like Napoleon's soldiers coming back from Moscow. We had not conquered Moscow. We were on the run by then. It cost a bundle. Personal Power's unceremonious removal from the supermarket shelves marked a humiliating end for the brand. It's difficult to put an exact price on the failure, but some analysts believe Unilever invested as much as a quarter of a billion pounds in Personal Power, only to have to go straight back to the drawing board. It seems incredible that such a highly regarded company should have got itself into such a mess. That perception of a brand is such a precious thing that you never mess with it. You never, ever take a risk with it. Particularly in today's marketplaces, which are so competitive, there's real pressure to innovate and innovate fast. I think it was R&D, in my view, rightfully being aggressive in terms of what they wanted to do and producing different formulations, getting hold of an idea and maybe running with it too quickly, to be fair but also because of intense competitive activity and scrutiny, there's pressure on people to cut corners. Under pressure, personal power had been developed to maximise stain busting at the expense of product care. The problem was that we had pushed the cleaning credentials of the brand a little bit further than perhaps we ought to have done. And the result of that was that the level of damage was greater than perhaps we ought to have been responsible for. One thing that most of us are not particularly good at is spotting our own mistakes. That's just human, really. But in business, it's a real problem because competitive markets are incredibly unforgiving of any errors that a company makes. The business skill that's so important is recognising your weaknesses before your competitors do. A similar situation arose in the 1980s when petrol giant Shell launched its new Formula Shell Petrol. It was supposed to offer a smoother drive and cleaner exhaust, but the multi-million pound product was accused of damaging engine valves. It's been a financial and public relations disaster. Formula Shell was subsequently withdrawn. As for Unilever, it rushed to recover the situation by releasing a new, softer formula, without any manganese accelerator. It regained its position as market leader four years later with Purcell tablets.
This car, the Mini, is Britain's best-selling car ever. Over five million sold. But its success in terms of sales hides a very surprising fact. We consumers got a much better deal on buying Minis than we ever should have. In any analysis of companies that uh, failed, something like about seven out of ten of those is to do with getting the price wrong. They could have choked off some demand and raise, raise the price. We look back at it now, it's, it's insane. Absolutely insane. You work so hard to create a cool brand and you can't make enough money out of it. This is a story that reveals how important it is to get your pricing right if you want to turn a successful product into a successful business. In the 1950s, fewer than one in five families owned a car. More and more consumers aspired to buy one. But the Suez Crisis left Britain without its assured supply of oil, and it dented the demand for the large gas-guzzling vehicles of the time. In the wake of the Suez Crisis, uh, there was a, a crying need for something which was extremely economical. The cheapest cars on the market were German three-wheeler bubble cars. Cheap to buy and cheap to run. Sales tripled in the late 50s, and British car bosses knew they had to win back the initiative. The remit was to produce something which was the same size as that sort of car, but produce hugely higher standards of accommodation and performance. The British Motor Corporation hired legendary designer Alec Isigonis. His brief? A small car which would be affordable to everyone. I mean, that Mini was a stroke of genius. He condensed the essence of a car. into something that was, wasn't extravagant or wasteful in any way. It was, a, it was a brilliant, brilliant design. Within a year, Alec Isagonis took his Austin Mini prototype to BMC boss Sir Leonard Lord. I told him, would you like to come for a ride, Nick? And he said, hmm, 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 yes, yes. He brought over for us to try the prototype of the Mini and I drove him at a hell of a speed. <laughs> I'm sure he was terrified. We were all absolutely bowled over by the swervability, drivability of this amazing skateboard. He got out of the car and he said, go and make it. And I said to him, but look, I'm a designer, not a car manufacturer. <laughs> Leonard Lord had given the Mini the go-ahead. Next, he decided on the price. Sir Leonard Lord said, we want to put this car on the market for less than £500. At that price, it would be cheaper than its rival, the Ford Anglia. We knew that the Ford Anglia was above £500 and that there would obviously be an impact on that product. The stage was set for Mini's big launch. I came out dressed as a magician, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to show you something magical in car design. And I waved the magic wand, I said, the magic word is Izzy Gomez. Out came from this tiny car, the men and the ladies and the dogs and the baby and the luggage. And the audience has stood and cheered. And the effect was very moving and very impactful. That moment also made waves at Ford. There were some people at fairly senior level who were really shaken by the Mini. They thought it would cost us volume on the Anglia. Um, and there were some very strong arguments in the boardroom. <laughs> For Ford, things were going to get worse. Tony Ball had another trick up his sleeve, which was to make the Mini the most desirable car on the market. We ensured that personalities like the Beatles, Ringo, and Paul, and John Lennon, and uh, 
Peter Sellers had the first minis and were seen in them and talked about. When celebrities started buying them, people said, oh, well, perhaps I should have one then. The mini attracted a lot of good publicity and it was really starting to take the market. BMC clearly had a hit on their hands, a car that was both desirable and inexpensive. But Ford bosses were bewildered. They couldn't understand how BMC could manufacture the Mini so cheaply. So Ford decided to dismantle a Mini and discover its inner secrets. We analysed the Mini and we would dismantle the things completely, even to the point of breaking spot welds if we needed to do so. And we tore down, weighed and costed on every component. Ford's team calculated how much it would cost them to make the Mini, and the result was a figure they couldn't believe. Based on our analysis, Ford would have incurred 35 pounds of cost over and above the price that they were advertising it at. BMC was selling the Mini too cheaply. If Ford couldn't do it profitably, then it was very unlikely anybody else could. It represented fantastic value for money, uh, perhaps too good value for, for money. Clearly, it was a massive error of biblical proportions. That you've created this icon and you're not making a penny out of it. You can obviously not price a product at less than it costs you. That, that defeats the object of being in business in the first place, which is to make a profit. The sheer incredulity of the thing, somebody turning out, I don't know what they're doing, five or six hundred a day, losing 35 pound a car. I mean, gosh, you can see the money building up in front of your eyes. Incredibly, by insisting that a Mini had to be cheaper than 500 pounds, it appears that Sir Leonard Lord had given scant attention to the issue of production costs. In the culture of BMC, we didn't need to know anything about the costs, and so we weren't told anything about the costs. The man on the assembly line certainly would have no concept of costs, nor would his boss, nor would his boss's boss. All we had to do was to get the cars out of the factory and built. That's probably a reflection of the, the late 50s, early 60s management that we had in the UK automobile industry, which was heavily subsidised, was heavily government stimulated at the time, and as a result they produced a wonderful product, wonderful idea, but at too low a price. The goal of a company is not just to sell more, it's to sell more if the money it makes from doing so more than that weighs the money it spends. And that makes pricing an all-important skill in business. It has to marry two things, the cost of the company on the one hand and the amount that the consumer is willing to pay for a product on the other. He's got it! It's super! People will pay higher for a product that says something about them, which says that I only buy the best cars. So pricing, it's by no means always about making it as cheap as possible. It is said that dealers were forced to take Maxis and Morris 1100s, a lot of other cars, to have one Mini. So I'm certain it helped the overall business, even if it didn't make money itself if they'd gone out and talked to the customers who were waiting on these long lists for the minis. I'm sure they would have found that a lot of them would have been quite happy to pay a little bit more and the company would have made a lot more money. The thing for me is that it was a wonderful piece of engineering and totally unique and original. They probably could have sold it for more money. In due course, BMC started to build pricier, high-spec versions of the car to create some profit. And you've got the Mini Coopers, for which you could charge more money, but for not very much added cost. So all those things hopefully contributed to an improvement in profitability. Whether it was enough, it's not for me to say.
production of the Mini ended in the year 2000. By then, it was owned by one-time bubble car manufacturer BMW. It went on to launch its own version of the Mini, with prices ranging from 11 up to 24,000 pounds. It seems unlikely BMW has made the same mistake. New and improved, two words that businesses love to use. But often it turns out we choose to buy our old favourite. Thank you very much. And the last thing we want is for the winning formula to be changed in any way. Coca-Cola is the world's biggest brand. Its success depends on one essential, a secret recipe kept under lock and key. When you buy Coke, you're buying into a branding heritage, a cultural icon. It's an extraordinary product. People did not want that tampered with. This is the story of an intense rivalry, an ill-considered decision, and Coke shooting itself in the foot. It was April 1985, and Coca-Cola had summoned the press to an important announcement in New York City. I think the anticipation would be that whatever Coke did would be a smart move. No one anticipated it wouldn't be. Camera crews, the major publications, everybody was going to be there. They orchestrated that part of the, the event quite well. They know how to do an event. The really incredible thing was that they were able to keep this a secret for so long. Coke chairman Roberto Goizetta was ready to let out his secret. I'm going to get right to the point. The best soft drink, Coca-Cola, is now going to be even better. Simply stated, we have a new formula for Coke. For a second, the room is dead quiet. And that was a surprise. Coke represents America. And it was sort of like saying, well, we've decided to change the American flag and put the stars someplace else. I mean, what, what, why, we, what? why are you doing that? <laughs> Cola drinks were invented in the 19th century. Before long, Coke and Pepsi became arch rivals. But by the Second World War, Coca-Cola had established its supremacy. The US government came to Coke and asked if we could provide Coca-Cola to the troops. We actually had 64 portable bottling plants move around with American GIs. And when the soldiers left, Coca-Cola stayed, making it a global player. In all the world, the best-loved sparkling drink is Coca-Cola. We uh, outsold uh, Pepsi-Cola by margins of two to three to one. Coca-Cola always believed it was its secret formula which gave it the edge. Coke has a distinctive flavor all its own that no one has ever succeeded in matching. And for years, Coke's position was unassailable until... We were just the upstart, the number two, had been the number two for years and years and years. By the 70s, tired of trailing behind, Pepsi needed something brilliant, something that would change the game. All across America, people are taking the Pepsi challenge. Pepsi came up with a marketing masterstroke. We instituted the Pepsi challenge which told people, which told the nation, that more people preferred the taste of Pepsi to Coke. Can you tell me which one you prefer? L. You're both sure you like L better? Mm -hmm. What was your choice? <laughs> <laughs> and that resulted in significant share gain, and that was very difficult for Coke to accept, because they had been the champion forever. The Pepsi challenge became a real problem for us and a great concern to our marketeers. And which was it you preferred? Pepsi. Just over half the Coca-Cola drinkers tested prefer Pepsi. 
Seriously, I mean, I remember it at the time. You almost couldn't refer to Pepsi. It was called PC. It was like your worst enemy. It really was. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Everyone, I believe, on both sides was very, very involved in, let's call it the Cola Wars. That's exactly what it was. Year after year, bit by bit, they were uh, gaining market share. Tell me what you chose. Pepsi. Pressure was growing at Coke to get its market share back. I want you to tell me which of these two colas you prefer. Guy, come here, come here, come here. You prefer the Coca-Cola? Yeah, yeah, I do. You preferred Pepsi-Cola. <laughs> the Pepsi challenge was a winner. It appeared to prove that people preferred the taste of Pepsi. But even more importantly, it also convinced executives at Coca-Cola that the taste of Coke was its biggest problem. They began to think the unthinkable. The taste of Coke had to be improved. It was not something that you did lightly. You did a lot of market research. Almost 200,000 taste tests were conducted. And those tests showed people preferred the new sweeter flavor. To Coke bosses, this market research was conclusive. Armed with this data, they actually made the decision to go ahead, change the formula, introduce a new product into the marketplace, and withdraw the original formula. Dazzled by what the market research was telling them, Coca-Cola decided to ditch the flavor that had made it the number one drink all over the world and to replace it with a brand new cola the company had just invented. I remember thinking at the time that this was either unbelievably brave or unbelievably stupid. Thank you very much, Roberto. Well, we simply believe that this is the biggest news about Coca-Cola and the best news about Coca-Cola that we've ever announced or ever will announce. Consumers preferred the new taste over the original by a margin of 61 to 39. He expected us to love the idea, and he did not get the sort of cheer he anticipated. It just died. And then the questions came. I mean, are you 100% certain that this won't bomb this new formula? As I said, I think this is the surest move ever because the consumer made it. We didn't. They lost control of the meeting. And um, despite, you know, all the things they had planned, they didn't expect questions to be quite as um, harsh as they were. To what extent are you introducing this product to meet the Pepsi challenge? Oh, gosh, no. I mean, that's a uh, Pepsi challenge. When did that happen? <laughs> it was very awkward, and I think the tension sort of showed. The responses began to get a little angrier. Are you saying that, you, that Pepsi Cola has no more to do with this than Heinz baked beans or Hershey's Kisses? Well, I don't know. I don't know. You, have a, you can handle the English better than I can, <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to get into that argument with you. Thank you very much, and I'd like to invite you to the lobby to try the new taste of Coca-Cola. Thank you. Thank you. We taste the new Coke. Well, actually, it's on television, so you can see me do it. <laughs> it's sort of flat, and it is sweet, sort of like you left it in an open can in the refrigerator a while. Like the new drink, the press conference had gone rather flat. But Coca-Cola decided to press on. A great new taste, now it's opening that. A colossal event, it is reaching... And all across America, it created a huge fanfare to welcome new Coke. It took a few days for the consumer reaction to start to move negatively. Typically, in our consumer information center, we'd get about three to 400 calls a day. Suddenly, we were getting 1,500 calls a day. And these were not positive calls. These were negative calls. These were calls that basically said, 
I want my Coke back. We started to see protests in the street. When you went and changed the taste of Coke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, if you try the new Coke. For Pepsi, things could scarcely be better. It was a very big era, and it was very exciting because it was a day-by-day -day battle with Coke to uh, take advantage of the situation. In the universal search for great taste, it doesn't take a higher intelligence to figure out why one cola's changed and one cola's chosen. It's astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing that suddenly you give way to a weaker competitor, because that's what happened. On the streets, the demonstrations were getting angrier. It really got a little out of hand. My oldest daughter is 22. Her first word was Coke. Her second no word was man. mommy. Employees like myself uh, would be confronted by neighbors saying, what have you done? We'll call it drinkers of America. Thank you for participating. Militant Coke drinkers who wanted their old flavor back kept stepping up their campaign. Local drinkers of America. This was a new thing to see this sort of grassroots organizing around an issue that people felt strongly about. I put our names in. Keen to find out exactly what was going wrong, Coke executives went back to their market research. They realized they'd made some extremely significant errors. There is always a difference between blind taste testing and branded product testing. What you've got to remember with market research, and particularly if you're doing blind taste testing, is that you're doing it without all the brand associations attached. So for people to say, I prefer that product versus that product, there's only one element of what happens in brand thinking. We didn't ask all the questions we needed to ask. All we asked people was whether they preferred taste X to taste Y. We never asked them, how would you feel if we replaced X with Y? The funny thing about this case is that big old dominant companies like Coke are usually accused of being too stuck in their ways. They're like dinosaurs, unable to keep up with the world. What Coke found out was it's not as simple as that. Successful companies have reasons to be cautious of change. I have an expression I use to all my clients is check the bathwater for babies. Before you throw out what you do, just check. The prime lesson is that you don't mess with the brand that easily and that, in, in, in a sense, that quickly. And secondly, don't be over influenced by the noises of your competitor. Coke now knew it had messed up horribly and the error was in danger of handing Pepsi an all-out victory in the Cola Wars. Wars consist of a series of battles. What Pepsi felt at the time was we won this battle, but certainly Coke was not going to lie down and die and not come back with something else. And so the something that they decided to do was to bring back original formula Coca-Cola, this time branded as Coca-Cola Classic. 79 days after the introduction of new Coke, Coca-Cola executives came out again in front of the world's press, this time to say they were going to make a U-turn and revert to the old recipe. Our boss is the consumer, and we want them to know that we're really sorry. Some critics will say, Coca-Cola has made a marketing mistake. And some cynics say that we planned the whole thing. The truth is, we're not that dumb, and we're not that smart. It was a huge decision to change back, because this was an admission that the original decision was flawed. Corporations seldom say, I'm sorry, or we made a mistake. And it humanized them in a way that benefited that company to this day. It is such a strong brand that even if they make a mistake, you know, people see them like a brother or a sister, they'll, they'll forgive their brother and sister and they'll let them have another chance. If we ever heard of another one like this today, we'd go, wow, how can people do that? Not in, in the US, I think we've learned that lesson very well.
But in Britain, one drinks company did make the same error. In 2009, dry Blackthorn cider was made sweeter. After an onslaught of outraged comments and a social media campaign, the original dry taste was reintroduced in the cider-loving southwest of England. And when Heinz threatened to stop production of its salad cream in 1999, national newspapers and a varied group of celebrity salad cream connoisseurs mounted a campaign to save the sauce. The classic condiment was subsequently relaunched with a new higher price, leaving some wondering whether Heinz had orchestrated an elaborate marketing ploy. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. As for Coca-Cola, it had learned its lesson the hard way, but ultimately the new Coke experiment paid off. Well, what happened next was that it generated a huge amount of interest. Uh, it, it garnered all sorts of, of uh, fan love, consumer love, and it reached uh, market shares that it hadn't, it hadn't experienced for decades. When it comes to launching a new product, getting the timing right is crucial. You can have a brilliant idea, you can get the technology working, you can put all the money and marketing in the world behind it, you can give it the catchiest of names and still find it's obsolete before you've got a business up and running. It seems to me to be a technology that was bound to fail given the advantages of cellular. It seems ludicrous by today's standards with more mobile phones than people in the UK, but it once seemed like a good idea to launch a mobile that wasn't mobile. The mobile phone started life in the UK in 1985 with the launch of Vodafone and Cellnet. And quite frankly, if you owned a mobile phone then, you had to have pretty strong arms. They were known as bricks, I think more like breeze blocks, quite frankly. Mobility doesn't come cheap. The price is upwards of £1,000. If you had a mobile phone, you were normally seen as a, a bit of a yuppie in, in the city of London. But a new service aimed to change all that by bringing mobile calling to the masses. Rabbit is a new type of phone. Yeah. Inside, it works like an ordinary phone. Outside, you can use it wherever you see a rabbit sign. Rabbit, for the well-connected family. In a promotional blitz, the Rabbit system was launched in May 1992 by communications company Hutchison, which already owned a similar highly successful business in Hong Kong. Now, with a rabbit telephone, you had a cordless phone that worked in the home, like today's modern-day cordless phones. But when you went outside, if you were close to a rabbit hotspot, symbolised by the famous upside-down letter R, then that phone would also work in those locations outside. Rabbit bosses hoped that in urban areas you'd never be more than three minutes from a rabbit base station. In practice, customers couldn't often find the sites they needed to make those calls. They certainly couldn't receive calls because it wasn't geared towards receiving calls, it was only making calls. But when the Rabbit service was launched, its backers believed all these restrictions would be outweighed by the one very important trump card it had over its mobile competitors. The major marketing point was cost. The Rabbit system was cheaper to purchase, the rental was cheaper and the call charges were cheaper. Good afternoon, Rabbit Connection 9. Denise speaking. How may I help you? Our belief was that people would trade off the mobility that they were losing for the fact they were getting it significantly cheaper. I think if we'd seen a couple of million users on Rabbit as an ambition, that would have been probably a, a fair description of where we were at the time. But Rabbit's ambitions soon looked highly optimistic because the world of mobile was changing fast. Hello, who's there? It's Ewan. Ewan, where are you? South Africa. What are you doing? 
technology was about to deliver Rabbit a fatal blow, as analog and its chunky handsets evolved into the far more marketable global digital system still used today. Obviously, as the mobile phone established itself, its capabilities exceeded the Rabbit system with the introduction of text messaging, and of course also the tariffing, the costs, became far more attractive than previously. With Metro Digital, the only digital service with both national coverage and affordable phones. What changed the rules was the introduction of truly low-cost two-way mobile phones and then that whole argument about Rabbit being a good low-cost alternative really w w was blown out of the water. Superior mobile technology trumped Rabbit on too many selling points. The Rabbit system closed in December 1993 and it had been a financial failure. It had deployed 12,000 base stations in the UK, but only attracted 9,000 customers. Things just hadn't worked out the way the Rabbit team had hoped. If people were using a cordless phone in their house, Hello. and you could say to them, put that cordless phone in their pocket, and then they could take it out with them and make calls, it, it kind of made sense. In reality, when we look back, it was a bit silly, because if you took the phone out of the house and someone else was in the house, they didn't have a phone to answer. I think a fundamental issue is about whether you do enough research. It may well have been that they just didn't research well. It seems to me to be a technology that was bound to fail given the advantages of cellular technology. The fact that you had to be rooted in one spot, that you could only do outgoing calls or incoming calls, made it a technology that just didn't work. Rabbit was a great concept. Unfortunately, its concept was late by the time it was delivered. It did not match the coverage that we offered in the mobile world and certainly did not offer the choice of, of phones. If it had launched three or four years earlier, it would have stood a much better chance. If cellular phones hadn't become so widely available, I wonder whether people wouldn't have bought rabbit phones. Who knows? Mobile did become ubiquitous. But ultimately, it's not a story that ends altogether unhappily for Hutchison. Hutchison took the customer's technical knowledge and marketing experience of Rabbit and two months later launched the fully mobile network Orange, which grew into a worldwide multi-billion pound success. The future's bright. The future's orange. If you look at in the fullness of time that Hutchison sold Orange for 30 billion pounds and lost a couple of hundred million pounds on, on the other businesses that they, they launched and failed, I think you can put it into some sort of context that overall it, was, it wasn't a bad deal. You have a cutting edge, top selling product, a great business and then suddenly something comes along to disrupt your comfortable life. There was a time when Polaroid had it all. A brilliant must-have technology that made taking photos convenient and fun. Oh, that's a good one. Until an even more convenient technology changed the way we look at photos forever. I think it's very easy to go on making what you've made because you understand it, it's very safe, than you're taking no risks. When a product comes along that just blows your product out of the water, it's hard, really, really hard. Failing to solve the problem that digital created meant that Polaroid went from being a two billion shots a year bestseller to bust. In the old days, to see your images, first you had to use all your film, then take it to a lab, and then wait for it to be processed. It all took such a long time. Polaroid changed all of that. Yay! In the early 40s, American inventor Edwin Land was taking a photograph of his daughter on a film camera. His young daughter said, Daddy, why can't I see the picture? And Land, within moments, saw how he could provide an answer to that question. In America, a New York doctor demonstrates a revolutionary invention for cameras. Land set about inventing a new technology which would revolutionize photography with a print which develops before your very eyes. 
His invention reached the shops in 1948. All stock sold out in the first morning. Polaroid instant cameras soon captivated the world. It seemed to me that we were creating a new technology that people were just craving for. And Polaroid had a monopoly on the fast-growing instant photography market. We couldn't make enough film, we couldn't make enough cameras. Hey, meet the swinger, swinger. Polaroid swinger. In 1965, swinger. Polaroid launched its latest camera, the Swinger, emphasizing its low price. The business model was cameras are sold and then film will follow. The idea is to sell a camera at the lowest price that you can manage to sell it at, for you're not really making any profit on the camera, and then hook the customer into continuing to buy film. Unlike the cameras, the film was priced to ensure a good margin. And because only Polaroid film would work in Polaroid cameras, the company had a secure revenue stream. That surely was the model. There was no question about that, that if we sold five million cameras every year and each one of those cameras used 10 packs of film, that's a lot of film. The film was very profitable, and this was the engine that drove the company for decades. At its peak, the company shipped about 200 million packs of film per year. It was a lucrative business, but one with an inherent risk. I'm deeply suspicious of any business that relies on consumables. I think you're in a perilous position because someone's going to come along and do away with a consumable. It's going to happen because we don't like those sort of things as users. The threat to film came as the 80s arrived, along with digital technology. Digital was to transform the way we shoot, view and share our photos. At first, Polaroid invested in researching the new technology. Polaroid people recognized that the future of imaging resided in digital imaging. By the late 80s, they'd even developed a digital chip, which was way ahead of the competition. But there was one major obstacle which held Polaroid bosses back. Where did their profitable film pack making operation fit in the digital future? The the problem was how to come along with systems that made money, that had a business model that worked with the structure that the company had. The deep challenges included the commitment to hard copy. Very difficult to change that. Almost impossible. Now, what they would have to do if they wanted to transition into digital imaging is make a massive change in the way they did business. There would have to be a huge number of layoffs. They would have to be shutting down the factories that made the film. An absolutely, incredibly massive change. So Polaroid made its decision. Instead of changing its entire way of doing business, it chose to back away from going completely digital and to focus instead on doing what it always had done. Making cameras that use instant film. To counter the digital revolution, Polaroid launched a range of novelty film cameras. The Spice Girls camera, for example, or the Barbie doll camera. A variety of cameras that doesn't require a significant development expense and then can be marketed as new products. But it was a short-term solution. By the year 2000, digital cameras were becoming affordable. Polaroid was being abandoned by previously loyal fans. The reason I shifted to digital was because, for me, there was always that financial implication of what you're spending when you shoot somebody. So if I was doing eight shots in a day, I would do maybe eight packs of Polaroid. Whereas with digital, I could just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. Put your arm higher up, honey, at the back. It wasn't financially any more burden to do 80 or 100 images or 1,000 images. It didn't matter. That's good. That's exactly what we want. Polaroid found itself struggling for survival. We were losing sales as digital was making inroads, but yet we had the overhead expenses. So the company did what most companies do, is you start to lay people off, you start to close down operations, but now it becomes a race with time of sales going down, debt going up, 
disruptive innovations coming in in digital photography was the perfect storm for Polaroid. In 2001, Polaroid filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. We had invested our whole lives, our whole uh, capital, around chemistry to create a hard copy image. I don't know whether or not, because we'd invested all that money in our expertise, we weren't able to see that people wouldn't want the hard copy print. Sure as heck, I'm surprised that no one wants hard copy prints. I mean, uh, and I don't either. I wonder whether there was anything Polaroid could have done to have survived the advent of digital. It's hard to have some sort of born-again conversion to a completely new business. Yes, perhaps they should have accepted their big seller only had a future as a small niche item. But it's hard for any company to succeed when its main product becomes obsolete. Now, in particular, it's changing very, very rapidly. Something which is absolutely state-of-the-art, next year can be old hat. In the age of the internet and everybody having personal computers, we keep our photographs on, on a hard disk. Do you want to, like, have, you know, a cupboard full of images or do you want to have a computer that's got zillions of images on it and you can send them to your mates immediately? And they missed that. Polaroid missed it. Research and development is risky and very expensive. If you don't do it and you continue with your existing product, you're almost certain to dip down in sales and someone will come along with something better. And Polaroid is a very good example of that. Someone like Polaroid hit on something which was brilliant. Why would you want that to go away? You, you wouldn't, but it's not your decision. Nowadays, under new ownership, there are fresh signs of life for the brand. It's marketing instant film cameras and instant digital cameras. And it's signed up pop phenomenon Lady Gaga as its creative director. It's competition that often drives firms to do great things, but it can also lead them astray. The problem seems to occur when a company fixes its gaze too hard on a competitor, only to lose sight of its own business. That's true of Coke, deciding to get rid of the jewel in its crown. Mini, omitting to make some basic costing calculations. And Purcell, launching a product it hadn't tested enough. It's nearly always the businesses which strive to beat their rivals that make the biggest advances, and perhaps also make the biggest mistakes. If you'd like to discover more about any of these stories, go to our website and follow the link to The Open University. bbc.co.uk slash business nightmares. Next week, what happens when companies make mistakes in marketing and public relations? Including Sunny Delight, the soft drink with an ad campaign that attracted unhealthy headlines. Next on BBC Two, an operation which will allow a young man to smile for the very first time. Children's craniofacial surgery is on the way.